Chapter 5. Will privatizing the commons increase liberty? So-called anarcho-capitalists aim for a situation in which no land areas, no square footage in the world shall remain public. In other words, everything will be privatized. Murray Rothbard, Nations by Consent, page 84. They claim that privatizing the commons, examples, roads, parks, etc., which are now freely available to all, will increase liberty. Is this true? Well, we've shown uh, already in this uh, in this segment how why the uh, uh, why the claim that privatization can protect the environment is highly implausible. But here we're going to concern ourselves with private ownership of commonly used property, which we all take for granted and generally pay for with taxes. It's clear from even a brief consideration of a hypothetical society based on privatized roads, as suggested by Murray Rothbard in For, New, For a New Liberty, pages 202 to 203, and David Friedman in The Machinery of Freedom, pages 98 to 101, that the only increase of liberty will be for the ruling elite. As so-called anarcho-capitalism is based on paying for what one uses, privatization of roads would require some method of tracking individuals to ensure that they pay for the roads they use. In the UK, for example, during the 1980s, the British Tory government looked into the idea of a toll-based motorway. Obviously, having toll booths on motorways would hinder their use and restrict freedom, and so they came up with the idea of tracking cars by satellite. Every vehicle would have a tracking device in, uh, installed in it, and the satellite would record where people went and which roads they used. They would then be sent a bill or have their bank balances debited based on this information. In the fascist city-state company town of Singapore, such a scheme has actually been introduced. If we extrapolate from this example to a system of fully privatized commons, it would, be, it would clearly require all individuals to have tracking devices on them or some other means of tracking so that they could be properly billed for use of roads, pavements, etc., Obviously, being tracked by private firms would be such a th uh, be a serious threat to individual liberty. Another, less costly option would be for private guards to randomly stop and question car owners and individuals to make sure that they had paid for the use of the road or pavement in question. Parasites would be arrested and fined or locked up. Again, however, being stopped and questioned by uniformed individuals has more in common with police states than liberty. Toll boothing every street would be highly unfeasible due to the costs involved and the difficulties for use that it, that it implements. Thus, the idea of privatizing roads and charging drivers to gain access seems impractical at best and distinctly freedom endangering if implemented at worst. <clears throat> of course, the option of owners letting users have free access to the roads and pavements they construct and run would be difficult for a profit-based company. No one could make a profit in that case. If companies paid to construct roads for their customers and employees to use, they would be financially hindered in competition with other companies that did not, and thus would be unlikely to do so. If they restricted a use to purely their own customers, the tracking problem appears again. Some may object that this picture of extensive surveillance of individuals would not occur or be impossible. However, Murray Rothbard, in a slightly different context, argued that technology would be available to collate information about individuals. He argued that, quote, it should be pointed out that modern technology makes even more feasible the collection and dissemination of information about people's credit ratings and records of keeping or violating their contracts or arbitration agreements. Presumably, in Anarchist society would see the expansion of this sort of dissemination of data, society without a state. So perhaps with the total privatization of society, we would also see the rise of private big brothers collecting information about individuals for use by property owners. The example of the Economic League, a British company who provided the service of tracking the political affiliations and activities of workers for, employees, uh, for employers springs to mind. <clears throat> And of course, these privatization suggestions ignore differences in income and market power. If, for example, variable pricing is used to discourage road use at times of peak demand to eliminate traffic jams at rush hour, as is suggested both by Murray Rothbard and David Friedman, then the rich will have far more freedom to travel than the rest of the population. And we may even see people having to go into debt just to get to work or move to look to work. Which raises another problem with the notion of total privatization. The problem that it implies the end of freedom of travel. Unless you get permission, or this seems more likely, pay for access, you will not be able to travel anywhere. As Rothbard himself makes clear, so-called anarcho-capitalism means the end of the right to roam or even travel. He states that, quote, It became clear to me that a totally privatized country would not have open borders at all. If every piece of land in a country were owned, no immigrant could enter there unless invited to enter and allowed to rent, purchase, or, uh, or purchase property. Nations by Consent, page 84. 
What happens to those who cannot afford to pay access? Is, uh, is not addressed at all. Perhaps being unable to exit a given capitalist land, they will become bonded laborers or be imprisoned and used to undercut workers' wages via prison labor. Perhaps they'll just be shot as trespassers. Who can tell? Nor is it addressed how this situation actually increases freedom. For Rothbard, a totally privatized country would be as closed as the particular inhabitants and property owners, not the same thing, we must point out, desire. It seems clear then that the regime of open borders that exists de facto in the U.S. really amounts to a compulsory opening by the central state and does not genuinely reflect the wishes of the proprietors. Nations by Consent, page 85. Of course, the wishes of non-proprietors, you know, the vast majority of people, don't matter in the slightest. Thus, it is clear that with the privatization of the commons, the right to roam, to travel, would become a privilege, subject to the laws and rules of the property owners. This can hardly be said to increase freedom for anyone bar the capitalist class. Rothbard does acknowledge that, quote, in a fully privatized world, access rights would be obviously a crucial part of land ownership. Nations by Consent, page 86. Given that there's no free lunch, we can imagine we'd have to pay for such rights. The implication of this, um, the implications of this are obviously unappealing and an obvious danger to individual freedom. The problem of access associated with the idea of privatizing the roads can only be avoided by having a right of passage encoded into the general libertarian law code. This would mean that road owners would be required by law to let anyone use them. But where are the absolute property rights in this case? Are the owners of the road not to have the same rights as other owners? And if right of passage is enforced, what would this mean for road owners when people sue them for car pollution-related illnesses? The right of those injured by pollution to sue polluters is the main way that so-called anarcho-capitalists propose to protect the environment. It's unlikely that those wishing to bring suit could find, never mind sue, the millions of individual car owners who could have potentially caused their illness. Hence, the road owners would be sued for letting polluting or unsafe cars onto their roads. The road owners would therefore desire to restrict pollution levels by restricting the right to use their property and so would resist the right of passage as an attack on their absolute property rights. If the road owners got their way, which would be highly likely given the need for absolute property rights and is suggested by the variable pricing way to avoid traffic jams mentioned above and were able to control who used their property, freedom to travel would be very restricted and limited to those whom the owner considered desirable. Indeed, Murray Rothbard supports such a regime. In the free <laughs> society, they, the travelers, would in the first instance have the right to travel only on those streets whose owners agreed to, let the, uh, to have them there. Ethics of Liberty, page 119. The threat to liberty in such a system is obvious to all but Rothbard and other right libertarians, of course. To take another example... Let us consider the privatization of parks, streets, and other public areas. Currently, the individuals can use these areas to hold political demonstrations, hand out leaflets, picket, and so on. However, under so-called anarcho-capitalism, the owners of such property can restrict such liberties if they desire. Calling such activities initiation of force, although they cannot explain how speaking your mind is an example of force, likely. Therefore, freedom of speech, assembly, and a host of other liberties we take for granted would be reduced, if not eliminated, outright under a right libertarian regime. Or, taking the case of picketers and other forms of like social struggle, it's clear that privatizing the commons would only benefit the bosses. Strikers or other activists picketing or handing out leaflets in a shopping center are quickly ejected by private security even today. Think about how much worse it would become under so-called anarcho-capitalism when the whole world becomes a series of malls. It would be impossible to hold a picket when the owner of the pavement objects. For example, as Rothbard himself argues again in The Ethics of Liberty, page 132, and if the owner of the pavement also happens to be the boss being picketed, then workers' rights re are reduced to zero. Perhaps we could also see capitalists suing working class organizations for littering their property if they do hand out leaflets, so placing even greater stress on limited resources. The IWW went down in history for its rigorous defense of freedom of speech because of its rightly famous free speech fights in numerous American cities and towns. 
Repression was inflicted upon Wobblies, who joined the struggle by private citizens, but in the end, the IWW won. Consider the case under so-called anarcho-capitalism. The Wobblies would have been given criminal aggressors, would have been criminal aggressors as the owners of the streets have re refused to allow undesirables to use them to argue their case. If they refused to acknowledge the decree of the property owners, private cops would have them taken away. Given that those who controlled city government in the historical example were the wealthiest citizens of the t in town, it's likely that the same people would have been involved in the fictional so-called anarcho-capitalist account as well. Is it a good thing that in real account the Wobblies are hailed as heroes uh, of freedom, but in the fictional one they're the criminal aggressors? Does converting public spaces into private property really stop restrictions on free speech being a bad thing? Of course, Rothbard and other right libertarians are aware that privatization will not remove restrictions on freedom of speech, association, and so on, while at the same time trying to portray themselves as supporters of such liberties. However, for right libertarians, such restrictions are of no consequence. As Rothbard argues, quote, any prohibitions would not be state-imposed, but would simply be requirements for residence or for use of someone's per, uh, some person's or community's land area. Again, nations by consent, page 85. Thus, we yet again see the blindness of right libertarians to the commonality between private property and the state. The state also maintains that submitting to its authority is the requirement for taking up residence in its territory. See chapter 2, section 3. As Benjamin Tucker noted, the state can be defined as, in part, the assumption of sole authority over a given area and all within it. The Individualist, Anar uh, Individualist Anarchist, page 24. If the property owners can determine prohibitions, i.e. laws and rules, for those who use the property, then they are the sole authority over a given area and all within it, i.e. a state. Thus, privatizing the commons means subjecting the non-property owners to the rules and laws of the property owners, in effect privatizing the state and turning the world into a series of monarchies and oligarchies without the pretense of democracy and democratic rights. These examples can hardly be said to be increasing liberty for society as a whole, although so-called anarcho-capitalists seem to think they would. So far, from, uh, so far from increasing liberty for all, then privatizing the commons would only increase it for the ruling elite by giving them yet another monopoly from which to collect income and exercise their power over. It would reduce freedom for everyone else. As Peter Marshall notes, in the name of freedom, the so-called anarcho-capitalists would like to turn public spaces into property into private property, but freedom does not flourish behind high fences protected by private companies, but expands in the open air where it's enjoyed by all. Demanding the impossible, page 564. Little wonder Proudhon argued that, quote, if 